you for watching Morning Markets. Well, we have a lot of macro concerns as always, but this week we get to dig into the micro. On the TSX, 37% of TSX Composite members are reporting today. So we get to talk about a lot of stocks that you might have in your portfolio. And to help me do that today, we've got Chris Curlow on the desk. He's Senior Portfolio Manager and Investment Advisor at Canaccord. And we're teeing things up with you, Andrew Bell. You are the rock that we're building this show on <laughs> uh, with Suncor. Suncor reporting its latest results late last night, as they typically do. What's the takeaway? The numbers didn't don't seem to be a surprise. Cash flow modestly beating expectation. But the incredible thing is the number of deals that Suncor has announced in the past few months. Dejardin is highlighting that. Just to quickly give you a list, they closed the sale of their wind and solar assets for more than $700 million. They announced the sale of their North Sea assets for about $1.2 billion. And then they said they were going to be acquiring Total uh, Energies, oil sands assets, that deal worth more than $4 billion. And just to uh, add one more, they closed the acquisition of Tex stake in the Fort Hills oil sands project. So there's just been a flurry of deals by Suncor as they remake their portfolio. And I, before I forget, we are talking to Rich Kruger, the boss, uh, the new boss of Suncor. Uh, that's set for shortly after 5 p.m. Eastern time. Tara Weber will be doing that interview. Okay, thanks so much, Andy Bell, for that setup. Let's bring in Chris Curlow um, to talk about Suncor, but as well as the broader energy sector, because it has been struggling with these lower oil prices. How do you think about owning a name like Suncor today? Uh, like Andy mentioned, a lot of deal flow, you know, a lot to sift through. The tote can deal being the largest of the of the mix. Uh, it was about a 5.5 billion CAD deal, all cash. On the surface, looked pretty expensive, but when you consider the tax losses they bring in, probably accretive. Hmm. Lowers the risk for their bitumen refining operations. You know, we kind of sign end in sight, so taking that in kind of takes that risk off the table. Um, adds about 140 barrels a oil a day, which is meaningful. It's about 15% of their production that we saw in this quarter. Um, as much as results were as expected, it's still a billion dollars lower than they made last year. Which is what we're seeing broadly from a lot of these energy producers by the fact that oil prices are down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oil prices are, are down. We've been rejigging in the sector. Earlier this year, we actually came off of one of their largest competitors, Canadian Natural Resources, for more of a lighter weight as, and a barbell strategy, adding TC Energy, the former TransCanada, okay. uh, as well as a smaller ENP to get us kind of that beta on what we see as a longer term uh, recovery in the oil and gas space. So you still like it, but you're not, I guess, as pure play as you were a year ago. No, I mean, Energy in 2022 was where you needed to be to outperform in the Canadian market. Um, we're more bullish on sectors like materials and utilities uh, for the back half of this year um, for a variety of different reasons. But we do think that there's a long-term supply-demand mismatch from a lack of investment uh, over the past several years. And it's interesting you point out that our performance by uh, the energy stocks last year because it's that classic first is now worst. It's the worst performing sector on the TSX and the S&P 500 and tech is now the best performing sector on both sides of the border. Are you chasing that trade higher? Uh, that's a trade honestly we're fading if anything. Um, you know we saw a massive move. The, the Nasdaq year to date's up 17, 18 uh, percent largely driven by six or seven names. Um, and if you didn't have those names, you're in a tough position as a U.S. stock picker. Fortunately, we've held NVIDIA, which is one of those tech darlings. Um, you know, I get that FOMO from having trimmed it four times. But at Team LWC, we have a disciplined investment approach and, you know, got to go with what our strategy show us. I want to pick at that because I just mentioned it with Palantir and it just seems like it's right now it's it's kind of fairy dust. You're having conversations. Indications are definitely positive. But even Palantir didn't really nudge up its sales forecast. You know, if you marry how much the stock is rallying on M&A potential, they're not kind of pricing that in. And same with NVIDIA. I get that their chips enable it, but we're not yet there, right? We're still at the ground floor. And I worry about an investor chasing the name higher that any little misstep, so much air can come out of these names. Yeah, there's certainly an air pocket that's been built up behind it. Um, you know, we try to echo the point that uh, the stock market's not the economy. And we think 2022, a lot of these names in a rate hiking regime have long duration assets. You know, the tech, the AI, that's all in the future. So when you're discounting that back at a higher rate, that malt that those earnings are smaller. Now with the market looking past the chasm of a possible even slowdown in the second half, 
rates you know are expected to decline so you're getting that boost on the opposite side of that trade um, you know where the fed moves from here uh, is to be determined and i think a lot of people are too focused on the micro and then you add to the fact that uh, the fang stocks are now trading a lower sales uh, growth rate than the overall index yeah can you weigh in on Shopify uh, getting clipped today, two analysts downgrading after a 30% rally? How do you think about Shopify within, is it kind of a special situation outside of your view of the fangs? Yeah, I mean, we look to the U.S. side for growth, Canada, you know, more for the LWC Canadian dividend model. So Shopify doesn't fall in that universe for us, but it's, you know, getting that air pocket boost that the fangs are getting as well. Huge move higher once they kind of realize it's going to be hard to compete with Amazon. Sold off their fulfillment business. Took a quick look on the downgrades today. Both, da well, at least the one I looked at came with a 20% increase on the price. Yeah. So, you know, these people are just trying, you got to play catch up as an analyst. Uh, I wouldn't put too much weight on that. It's just, a, again, a valuation situation. When your stock runs that fast, it's hard to justify saying now's the time to buy. So, from your perspective, is it that it doesn't qualify with your portfolios or that it's just not a name you're not interested in? Uh, so in Canada, we do uh, mostly large cap Canadian dividend investing with a quantum mental screen that kind of narrows that universe to about 180 names. You know, shop with no dividend, no dividend growth yeah. doesn't qualify. On the U.S. side, we're looking for growth, much larger opportunity set. Shopify is a fantastic company, but when I can own anything else on the U.S. side, it just... We, we prefer to take that strategy. Well, let's talk about the big dividend names in Canada, and you can't ignore the banks within that conversation. I talked about this downgrade by John Aiken at Barclays, and it just seems to be a sector call. Um, and, and he himself has admitted it's not rocket science. Banks struggle when there's a recession, so kind of get out of the way. How do you think about that? Again, we're looking past the chasm. We don't see contagion risk in the banking sector based on you know recent events uh, south of the border. Um, and we've had a bit of a baby with the bathwater situation. A lot of these even money center banks in the States, our, our banks here in Canada, have been dra dragged down with the whole sector. Uh, we're long TD in Scotia. We look longer term on our Canadian dividend plays and think at these levels, there are attractive entry points. So let's pick those apart. Scotia has been an outperformer. It's actually one of the names. It was cut all the way to sell. Uh, a story in transition, a new CEO, more targeted focus on its international operations. Is that why you like it? Uh, we like Scotia because of the diversified business mix. Um, They're all diversified. <laughs> no, but I mean from a geographical standpoint. Okay, okay. So it's the most geographically diversified. <laughs> okay. They all obviously have different aspects that drive the, the business and you kind of look at the relative, you know, PNC lending or mortgages, et cetera. You know, we do like that international approach. We've been moving more aggregately assets offshore in preference of developed Europe, uh, Japan. Um, looking at Latin America as well, where Scotia has a massive presence, obviously. Um, but then just from a relative valuation standpoint, it's closed the gap, but still we think has some room to run relative to its peers. TD um, is a bit of a mess right now with Charles Schwab, First Horizon not going through. And what do they say? It's like got this huge problem of $15 billion it's sitting on and it can't deploy. Nice dividend yield, though, while they mm -hmm. uh, figure it out. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, like really high exposure to the U.S. side. Um, again, we just see a little bit of overvaluation when you're looking at that U.S. side. And then, uh, but... It does have, you know, the first Horizon deal, TD's a risk adverse bank. Uh, things have moved in the wrong direction. They were able to come out of it. Um, having dry powder in a time when you are moving into a period of economic uncertainty with where regional banks are going, it's so something else might they're pop being up. penalized for it. Yeah, I think just a lot of people are already counting the chips on that one.